Now we're finally ready to look at the definition of integrability. So let's get to it. So let's say we've got a bounded function f from an interval a, b to r, and then we set this thing script p equal to the set of all partitions of a, b. Then we're going to define two things, the upper integral and the lower integral. So the upper integral of f on this interval is the infimum of all upper sums as we let this partition range over all partitions of a, b. And then the lower integral is going to be the supremum of all of these lower sums as again we let this partition range over all partitions of a, b. Finally, we say that f is Riemann integrable if the lower integral is equal to the upper integral. And in that case, we give it a new notation, which is probably familiar from calculus. So this is the integral from a to b of f. We're gonna start by proving a pretty simple observation, but I think this is important to see the kind of tools that we'll use. So we're gonna prove that the lower integral of f is always less than or equal to the upper integral of f. And we're gonna do this by way of contradiction. So in other words, we're gonna suppose that the upper integral of f is strictly less than the lower integral of f, and then see that something goes wrong there. Okay, good. So notice that the upper integral of f, that is going to be the infimum of all of these upper sums. So I wanna use the fact that since u of f is strictly less than l of f, there exists a partition p, maybe we'll call it p1 of a, b, such that the following is true. We have u of f is less than or equal to u f comma p, which is strictly less than l of f. So in other words, we can find a partition where that upper sum of the partition fits in between this u f and this l f. And so why can we do that? So if this were not possible, then we would contradict the definition of the infimum, which is built into this upper um, integral. Okay, now we're gonna do the same kind of thing, but we're going to do it with L of F. So let's say here that there also exists some partition P2 of A, B, such that U of F is less than or equal to U F P1, which is strictly less than L F P2, which is less than or equal to L of F. And again, that's by the definition of this lower integral via the supremum. So if we could not find such a partition, then this lower thing would not have been the supremum. Okay, great. So now let's see what we've got. We've got two partitions, P1 and P2, where the upper sum over one partition is smaller than the lower sum over the other partition. But we know for a fact, this was proven in the last video, that the lower sum of F over a partition P2 is always less than or equal to the upper sum of F over any other partition. But that provides us with our contradiction because this inequality and this inequality are not compatible. Okay, great. So let's maybe get rid of this and then we're gonna prove a nice theorem that classifies when a function is integrable. So just like with many definitions in mathematics, often proving something via the definition is a bit tricky and what you need is some sort of more calculational approach and often there are theorems that go and prove that this calculational approach is equivalent to the definition and that's what we've got here. So f, which is still a bounded function, is Riemann integrable. I left off the word Riemann, but anytime we say integrable for the time being, it will be Riemann integrable. On the interval a, b, if and only if, for all epsilon bigger than zero, there is a partition p epsilon of a, b, such that the upper sum of f on that partition minus the lower sum of f on that partition is less than epsilon. Now maybe I wanna point out real quick that the upper sum is always bigger than or equal to the lower sum. So we know that this is gonna be always bigger than or equal to zero in the first place. So this is bound between zero and epsilon. 
but since epsilon can be made as small as we want, that means these two quantities can be made as close together as we want. So notice the right hand side of this if and only if statement is very calculational, whereas the left hand side is built out of this definition that we have over here. Okay, so let's maybe get to the proof. So since this is an if and only if statement, we need to do two directions. So let's start with the reverse direction. So we're gonna begin by taking any epsilon bigger than zero and then finding our partition P epsilon such that this inequality is satisfied. So we've got zero is less than or equal to U F P epsilon minus L F P epsilon, which is less than epsilon. Great. So again, we're working backwards or the reverse direction so we can assume that this kind of thing is possible. Now we're going to use the following string of inequalities, which is always true, and that goes like this. L F P epsilon is always going to be less than or equal to L of F. So in other words, the lower sum is always less than or equal to the lower integral. That's because this lower integral is the supremum of all such lower sums. But now that's less than or equal to U of F by our previous observation. But now that's less than or equal to U F P epsilon. Again, because the upper integral is always less than or equal to the upper sum, given that the upper integral is the infimum over all such possible upper sums. But now we can look at this string of inequalities and use the fact that these two are close together to force these two close together. In other words, we have the following setup. We have u of f minus l of f is less than or equal to u f p epsilon minus l f p epsilon, but that's less than epsilon. And then I guess I should maybe say over here that all of this is bigger than or equal to zero. So let's see what we've got going on here. We've got this arbitrary epsilon bigger than zero. And after taking this arbitrary epsilon bigger than zero, we have shown that the difference of the upper integral and the lower integral is bound between zero and epsilon. So in other words, we can make this difference between the upper integral and lower integral as small as we want. They are arbitrarily close together. But from one of the maybe first theorems that we proved in the whole class, that tells us that these two numbers, uf and lf, are the same. And that finishes this reverse direction. Okay, let's maybe do the forward direction now. Now we're ready for this reverse direction. So we want to suppose that f is bounded and Riemann integrable. So I'll just say integrable on our interval a, b. Good. And then next, we also want to be given some arbitrary epsilon bigger than zero. And then our goal is to find this partition that makes this inequality true. Okay, so we wanna do two things first, and that is find a partition related to the upper integral and the lower integral. So let's first find P1, a partition of AB, such that the following inequality is true. We have U F P1, in other words, that upper sum of F on P1 is less than U F plus epsilon over two. So let's maybe talk our way through why we can do that. Well, if that were not possible, that would contradict the definition of uf by the infimum. And actually, this kind of construction was something really familiar that we did at the very, very beginning of the class. Okay, great. And then next, we want to find a partition P2 such that we've got a similar but different inequality for the lower sum and lower integral. And in this case, we want LF P2 to be bigger than LF minus epsilon over two. And again, that's by the definition of the supremum or the um, least upper bound. Okay, great. Now what we want to do is form a partition out of P1 and P2, and this is going to be the so-called common refinement. And we'll 
call that co common refinement p sub epsilon. So that'll be our partition that we want. So we've got p sub epsilon equals p1 union p2. So like I said, this is the common refinement of p1 and p2. Look in one of the previous videos if you need a reminder of what the refinement of a partition is. Now let's look at our goal thing right here. So we have zero is less than or equal to u f p epsilon minus l f p epsilon. So we know that this is gonna be bigger than or equal to zero just by the definition of the upper sum and the lower sum. But next thing that I wanna do is replace u f p epsilon with this thing that is larger and I'll replace LFP epsilon with this thing that is smaller. But that's gonna keep my inequality going in the correct direction because I have minus LFP epsilon. So in fact, I'm gonna use this fact right here that minus LFP epsilon is in fact less than um, epsilon over two minus L of F. Just multiplying by the minus one changes the direction. But now we can just like essentially add these two inequalities and we're done. So let's see what we get when we do that. So here we will get that this is strictly less than u of f minus l of f plus epsilon over two plus epsilon over two. But we know that u of f and l of f are the same because we have assumed integrability of our function f. So that turns out to be epsilon over two plus epsilon over two, which is epsilon. So in the end, we have our desired inequality to finish off this forward direction. Okay, let's get rid of this and we're gonna do one more theorem. We're gonna finish this video off by looking at a classic and very important theorem. So this says that if F is continuous on a closed interval A, B, then it is integrable on this closed interval as well. So I first want to notice that continuity plus the compactness of this closed interval implies that F is uniformly continuous on AB. So let's maybe notice that first. So F is uniformly continuous on our interval a b again because continuity plus compactness of the domain implies uniform continuity okay so next we want to be given epsilon bigger than zero and our goal is to form a partition that makes the upper sum minus the lower sum over that partition less than epsilon okay but we need to use this continuity in fact we want to use this uniform continuity so let's go ahead and take delta bigger than zero such that if the absolute value of x minus y is less than delta, where x and y are both on the interval a, b, but they're within delta of each other, we have the absolute value of f of x minus f of y is less than not just epsilon, but epsilon over b minus a. So again, this delta is brought into existence because of the uniform continuity of f on a, b. That's why it works for all x and y within delta of each other. Okay, great. Now we're gonna start constructing our partition. There's a bunch of ways to do this. I'm gonna do this a very concrete way. So let's go ahead and find some natural number, which I'll call n, such that b minus a over n is less than delta. And so that's possible by the Archimedean principle because you can maybe uh, move this around until you get n is bigger than some real number, but you know that you can always find a natural number bigger than any real number. But again, this is the kind of stuff that we do all the time at this point. Okay, so next we want to define the points in our partition. So I'm gonna define them like this. We'll set xi equal to a plus i times b minus a over n. Good. So this is like a plus i delta x like you might have seen in a calculus two type class. Now, what I wanna notice here is that xi minus xi minus one is gonna be less than delta. 
And that's gonna be true uh, for all i. In fact, this actually partitions it into equal spaced points, which is not necessary at all, but that's what happens here. Okay, now next we're gonna consider the following partition P, which is gonna be equal to x zero, which is A. So I'm just setting x zero equal to A, and then I've got x one, x two, all the way up to xn, but xn is equal to B by this definition right here. Now next, I'm going to look at the upper sum of f on this partition and the lower sum of f on this partition, and I'm going to take their difference. So let's go ahead and do that. We've got ufp minus lfp, like that. So again, let's go ahead and really get into the definition here. So this is going to be the sum as i goes from 1 to n of capital M sub i minus little m sub i times x sub i minus x sub i minus 1. So I mash together the definition of the upper sum and the lower sum, but that, that's not really much. Okay, nice. But next, we can use the fact that by the extreme value theorem, the continuity of f and uh, the closed interval tells us that f achieves both its maximum and its minimum, or its supremum and its infimum. Those are the same when you're working over a compact set and a continuous function on each subinterval. So in other words, we can find some point, we could call it maybe yi, that achieves this number, and some point, maybe we could call it zi, that achieves that number. So that tells us that this is going to be equal to the sum as i goes from 1 to n of f of yi minus f of zi, and then this is going to be times xi minus xi minus 1. So let's maybe go ahead and point out over here exactly what we've done. So here we have yi is on the interval xi minus 1 xi, where f of yi is this capital mi. In other words, it's the supremum of f over that subinterval. Again, we know that as possible because we have the extreme value theorem. And then zi, well, that's going to be on this same interval. But now that's the point where f achieves its infimum or its minimum, so this lowercase mi like that. Then the next thing that I want to notice is that by this setup, we have the absolute value of yi minus zi is less than delta. And we know that just because these yi's and zi's are between these two numbers, those of which are within delta of each other. But what that tells us is that this difference is less than epsilon over b minus a. So that means we can bring that out of this whole thing if we introduce an inequality. So just to reiterate, all of these are going to be less than epsilon over b minus a from our construction right here because these points yi and zi are close enough to each other. So we've got this is less than epsilon over b minus a, and now we've got the sum as i goes from 1 to n of xi minus xi minus 1. Cool. But now that's a telescoping sum, and so that telescopes just to xn minus x0. So that's pretty easy to see. But xn minus x0 is exactly b minus a. So that's going to cancel out this denominator. And we get that this sum is now equal to epsilon. That actually finishes off the proof because we constructed a partition p where the upper sum of f on that partition minus the lower sum of f on that partition is less than epsilon. And that was for this arbitrary epsilon that we took at the top. Okay, that's a good place to stop.